Hello and welcome to today's lecture on localization in the serious self-driving car. My name is Daniel Wilbers and I am currently working in, at Scania's perception team for autonomous driving. Our focus there is explicitly on heavy vehicles. Formerly I have also been working at Volkswagen where I have been uh, involved in also various projects for autonomous driving. And around at the same time I was a PhD student at the University of Bonn, uh, where my topic explicitly was on localization. Today I will give you a few key insights um, from the industry and I will motivate why it is important to do things in a certain way. Um, and I will explicitly also focus on localization for urban driving and the requirements that stem from that. Let us take a look at this example uh, in the beginning. So in here you can see that we are standing at the junction and you will see that within the junction we are taking a left turn and then we will just continue basically driving. Now in this very specific example there are a lot of things that we can actually do whenever we are able to localize ourselves. So, for example, um, in this specific scenario, when we have a map, as you can see here on the left side, and given that we know roughly where we are on this map, we can use, for example, the um, position of the vehicle and the post to do navigation, very similar to what everyone basically knows from um, the standard navigation systems. But in comparison to, the, to that, if we are able to really compute a very accurate and highly precise pose within this map, then we can actually enable other automated driving functions. For example, here, if we very precisely know where we are, then we can take the location from traffic lights, for example, and then we know where to search for them in the image, as you can see here on the right side. And in addition, then, you know that the three traffic lights here on the left side are relevant for this left turn and you can basically ignore the three other ones. And inferring this from perception only uh, is basically very, very tricky. So we can really ease uh, the automatic driving parts here whenever we know our very highly accurate position. In general, there are different localization techniques available on the more classical side and also um, very commonly used uh, side are the GNS-based techniques. And on the other side, we have techniques for localization that actually leverage environment perception. The hard part for GNNS-based localization, especially in urban environments, is that you sometimes have these building canyons, which makes it very hard uh, to actually have proper satellite reception in these scenarios. So GNNS sometimes in these scenarios will fail and it will be very difficult to only have a system that relies on GNNS in these scenarios. So what people and the community has done then is to develop techniques that actually try to actively perceive parts of the environments. And for in this example here, uh, if you know what three buildings you are seeing and you know basically uh, these two trees and you can compare it to a map, for example, then you can infer very similar to what a human does from experience where actually your uh, position on pose in this map is. To do these kinds of things, um, there are different sensors available on the vehicles and the most typical ones I would say are cameras, lidars and radars and there are perception based localization techniques for all of them. The tricky thing however is that to have a very robust system in the end it make, makes uh, much sense to try to combine all these different sensor modalities uh, into uh, one specific uh, model in the end where you can use this then to compute a very robust pose. Also um, 
Another flavor of localization meshes, so to say, is that you can have different aspects of the data that you are looking at. And for example, um, there are localization techniques that only take the raw data, meaning for example here the LiDAR scans, as you can see on the, uh, on the left side. And then based on these LiDAR scans, you do some um, scan matching and then try to infer um, the position um, based on the previously recorded LiDAR map that you have, for example. Then there is a method or there are several methods indeed um, that try to extract features from raw data, raw data. And then in this example here, you can see that, for example, these green points in the image here are uh, camera-based features. And then if you're using these camera features, you can extract them and try to match them to a map to infer your position. And then also the third option, so to say, is that uh, you're trying to search for landmarks and landmarks and features are both very similar terms usually in the community. But for the sake of this talk, um, landmark will be something that is um, something semantic. So a landmark here means that you, are, for example, have uh, a pole or basically the traffic light itself or you know that you have a traffic sign, you have the position and you can and also in the, in, have the information on the traffic sign available. All these things then would be uh, landmarks compared to features where features are only unsemantic unsem thing things basically. Now for all these three th things, it really depends on which uh, application you have and in which environment you want to be driving. To choose what is really appropriate uh, for, for localization in this sense. Today I will very much focus on the landmark part, uh, which is um, uh, from my point of view a very good idea for um, urban driving as you will see. Now when we are using landmarks for localization we typically take the raw sensor data and then we're trying to extract based on this raw data these specific um, semantic landmarks, so to say. And here in this example, uh, you can see that we are able to de uh, detect poles and also basically the shapes of the buildings from the LiDAR data. But here it actually doesn't really matter if you take the LiDAR data, this very same data here also could be from a camera, for example. You would just need to have a different algorithm for extracting the um, position basically in the image or even the 3D uh, feature uh, in the world basically to make this work. When you're doing this, um, the advantage basically of how having landmarks over raw data is that you're drastically reducing the um, space that you need to store the data uh, when you're um, or looking at a LiDAR raw map, for example, they, they, they can be uh, very huge uh, in, in comparison if you're only storing the already compressed information of a landmark, then the maps are typically much, much uh, smaller. Now, um, as I said, the, there are uh, on the same side LiDAR maps available and you can also have landmarks maps available and these specific maps can be very tailored to a specific localization approach. Uh, meaning that, for example, in the case of the LiDAR point cloud map, it could be, for example, the case um, that it has a specific resolution, a specific point density that you need, um, specific range basically that you can have to detect um, later the same things again. And then on, on the other side, there are pro the landmark maps are a bit more gener generic and a bit more general purpose in that sense. And this is because, for example, in this case here, when you see, take a look at the aerial image, what you can do is, for example, manually construct this map actually only based on this area image without ever looking at the sensor data. And the advantage really is here for the industry is that uh, you can separate the whole map generation process from the localization, where if your maps are very tailored to a specific sensor setup where you need the LiDAR map, for example, 
uh, you need to actually drive around and then create these maps um, first with, with a very similar sensor. Uh, however, on the landmark side, um, th this can be constructed in very different ways. So uh, these are, so to say, a bit more easy to generate in that sense. Now, whenever we have general purpose maps, the challenge, however, uh, is that we still need to be able to, de to detect the things that are in this map with the sensors that we have in the vehicle. And here, for example, you can see, I can see a comparison between um, what we can detect with the LIDARs and what we can detect with the radars. And you will notice here that uh, everything that is here painted a bit more black is actually available or can be detected with the both sensor modalities. While everything here in red is basically a false positive, something that is not in the map, in the map something that really comes from the tech detector. Of course, there are many different approaches available where you can uh, decide what kind of detector to use and you can make sure that you have less false positives. But still, you will always have the issue that because you're using different sensors, they will pick up different things. And if you want to use these general purpose maps, uh, you need to consider this in the algorithmic choice in the end. Now, zooming out a bit, if we take a look at what actually the problem is in landmark based localization, we can define it or try to formalize it a bit in this way. So for this talk and in general, um, I will assume now that we have some landmark detections available. It doesn't matter actually where they come from, which sensor modality we used. So these landmark detections could be from the 3D LiDAR scan. They could be also from the radar scan, as we saw on the previous slide, but they can also come from a camera thing. What I will, however, assume for now is that all these uh, detections are available in the vehicle reference frame that is illustrated here on the top right side. So meaning that we have a 2D location of the landmark detection uh, in the vehicle reference frame. That makes it a bit more easier to follow um, the steps that we can have. But however, in, in general, of course, this can be a more extra depending in the end on how you actually de do the optimization part. But we will come to that in a, in a few minutes. I will also assume that we have an odometry available. So we now we know how the vehicle moved over time uh, without having basically the global pose, but a local pose, so to say. Then I will also assume that we already have the general purpose map available. Uh, and I will also assume that we have some sort of low-cost GNNS receiver. And we need this basically to initialize um, the localization approach um, to, to limit the search space uh, when we start basically the vehicle up. And there can be other methods, of course, uh, to, to do this, but uh, it's easy in that sense just to use some regular a GPS receiver as it is available basically in every vehicle nowadays. And then the task here will be to compute the vehicle trajectory which is doing localization uh, and we will do this in global coordinates. Then the second thing here is that we will also um, try to find the position of landmarks and I will come to that in a later why this is also important. Uh, for now, it's important to just remember that um, the maps, of course, can get outdated over time. So you will need to have something in place, some process to make sure that the vehicle always has the latest map available. And this is where the landmark positions will uh, come in. Now, the simplified algorithm, so to say, that I will demonstrate to motivate a bit um, the, the localization for autonomous driving in urban areas looks like this. So on top here, you can see the four different types of input data that we um, have to our algorithm. And then you can see the three building blocks of the module, so to say, um, 
that we can use to uh, compute the positions of uh, the landmarks as well as the pose of the vehicle. And the very first step in the algorithm will be called localization, uh, sorry, uh, local association. And that means that we will try to figure out if a specific detection um, actually stems from the same landmark over time. So as when the vehicle drives past an object, uh, it will measure the specific landmark several times. And in localization, local association, we will try to figure out if all of these um, measurements belong to each other, so to say. And then in the second step, uh, which will be called map matching, we will take uh, the aggregated detections that we uh, have and we will match them to the general purpose map. Uh, and I will also in detail explain that algorithm. Then the third step is that we will have the sliding window graph and this is then the optimization technique here, uh, which is very similar to, to a standard SLAM system. But however, we will really separate the localization from doing mapping. So we will never actually change the map uh, on the fly. We will only generate positions that might be uh, then in the end uh, be sent to a backend so that uh, some, some other algorithm can figure out um, how to actually update the map. And I think this is also something important to highlight. Whenever you actually have a SLAM algorithm in, in serious development, I consider this very dangerous because um, you would need to have certain guarantees that these updates that you're um, computing for the map will not actually harm the vehicle or um, actually decrease the performance. So I think it's, it, it's a good idea to separate these two things and only do localization. And this is a bit uh, then where this, these two things um, yeah, part from each other. So this is not SLAM, but it's, it is localization plus maybe doing map refinement. So let, let's take a look at the input data that we actually have. And what you can see here is basically the bird's eye view from a LiDAR scan and everything that is flickering here are the detections that are picked up in each individual scan. So in blue here, you can see that we are detecting poles and poles can be the traffic lights itself. These can be some cones on the ground maybe, uh, or uh, everything basically that is cylindrical. So a pole in this semantics thing uh, description that I, where we distinguish a bit between features and landmarks would be that really this is a cylindrical object in 3D uh, space, which makes it a bit semantic. Then we are also de detecting the facades and the pla planes of the buildings as well as the corners and the road markings here which come from the camera. And as you were seeing, this flickering is basically the thing, and I, I will repeat this again, this flickering is actually pretty important. important. This is not a bug here. So this flickering means that each of these detections is individually picked up in the scan. This is not tracked over time. And this is important, uh, not, it is important not to have tracked data here because we will do the fusion uh, actually at a later point in time. And for that, we need some uh, assumptions about the measurement noise. And if we would do tracking, this would very complicate um, how we set up the, the noise model that we have. So take it, taking it, it is, uh, a look at the snapshot basic of the scenery here, you can see the different individual things that we picked up in one specific time, time scan. And for example, if you take a look in the middle, you can see where the, where the ego vehicle is, uh, that we also have false detections right in front uh, of the ego vehicle in, a different, in another um, a vehicle that is driving around there. Uh, the tricky thing for map matching and local association will be to ignore these things, uh, but this really depends heavily on what kind of detector you're probing, programming. And this here, of course, is just an example, uh, but it highlights basically in the end that the algorithms that we have 
will be very robust against these kinds of false uh, detections. And even if you now take a, bit, a closer look, you will see that there are also uh, several other false positive detections where these three ones that are highlighted here with the arrows, for example, I think are uh, humans walking around. Uh, it's funny that um, humans always are very perfectly cylindrical, so they will always with this kind of um, detector show up as a false positive. Uh, but you can also see, for example, that uh, the camera here, which uh, produces these purple road markings, also produce a false positive detection. Now, coming back to the local association that we are doing, this slide here highlights a bit um, how this is being done. And the idea here is actually very simple. Um, we take the already available optometry that we have, and this optometry uh, incorporates not only wheel take measurements, but it also incorporates the steering angle uh, as well as IMU measurements. So this means that we can get a relatively good pose um, over a, uh, or a relatively good movement of the vehicle over time. Um, so we can actually then use this local pose that we have from the odometry to project all the measurements uh, that we have from the landmarks into a common map, which you can see here on the right side. So all these green, green lines here are the detections and then we will uh, project them into this common map and um, you can then basically do some clustering over this to figure out if um, you have a lot of detections which are very close by and if uh, the density then there is high, you can assume that these are actually describing the same object. So the outcome basically of this step is that you have now associated here, for example, um, the two measurements um, for this landmark on the uh, middle left side, uh, where we know now that these should belong to each other. Now, the next step basically is to take this outcome here. And what we have just done is basically created a local map. And this local map, you can see this here on the left side. So every blue dot here in the local map already consists of several um, detections. We will still need the raw detections later when we are computing the factor graph. But for the sake of the map, map, map matching step, we can already use this uh, local map. And because the odometry and the standard passenger vehicles already is uh, good enough for doing this, this, uh, this local map is actually quite accurate in, in the sense that you're not having too many distortions uh, um, or scaling issues here. So. Uh, the issue here and the problem is to solve how to overlay this local map onto the global map that we can see on the right side. And I will uh, today dis um, a bit discuss and also show you one, one way of doing this overlay because this is a bit different now from uh, what, how you would do for example point cloud matching. So the standard algorithm here is that first of all, we are doing this initial projection. So, and I earlier said that we assume to have a low cost GNLS receiver, and we are just taking this uh, very inaccurate pose, so to say, uh, and we are projecting the local map into the global coordinate system here. So, and this will generate something uh, like this, as you can see here on the left side. And if you really take a close look, then you can see this is this still quite off. So this is not accurate at all. Uh, this projection was not good. Now, what this algorithm does is that we will now generate basically um, transformation candidates. We will uh, figure out um, then how good these um, transformations are. We will compute the cost basically for them. And then in the event, we will p pick the best transformation that we can apply to this um, problem here on the left side. Now, if we are taking a look at this one specific um, landmark here, you will see that one candidate, so to say, could be that we assume that the blue landmark here 
actually corresponds to this landmark uh, where the error points here in the map. And if we assume this, then we can basically translate the whole map according to this very uh, vector that we just generated. And if we have done this, we can now try to figure out how good actually this transformation is. And to do this, what we, we will now iterate over all the projected landmarks and we will try to figure out if there is a landmark in the map very close by to the one that we have um, projected. So the cost here then will be the distance to the closest landmark in the map that we find. And then an important thing is also to have some sort of punishment term. So whenever we have landmarks now that we projected where there is no landmark basically in the map, then we know this is either a false positive or actually uh, the, map, the transformation was wrong. Uh, so we need to, to have the punishment term here. The trick now really here in this very specific algorithm to do this in kind of a brute force way. And if, if you're now um, generating these um, red arrows, these candidates basically for uh, multiple landmarks that you have here, then you can very easily just test out every transformation that you generated. And you will see here sometimes that um, the transformation seemed to be very good, but most of the time this is actually very bad. But in the end, you will some find something that looks like this. So one of these transformations actually produced what you can see here. The important thing here to notice is also that we still have 19 uh, landmarks in here, which have not been able to be matched to the map. So meaning the, in this uh, very specific case, these 19 landmarks are actually false positive detections you can still see the two in the middle of the road that we had in the vehicle in front of us. Now, the, the next step, or going, going back maybe once more uh, to, to highlight uh, one particular thing. Doing this in a brute force way might seem a bit counterintuitive when it comes to comp uh, computation time. However, since you can make certain assumptions about the search space that you have, you will always be able to tune this uh, to exactly what you actually need in the end. And there is one major of advantage of doing this in a brute force way to having an algorithm that um, converges, for example, like ICP does. And the advantage is here really that you will never get stuck in some sort of local optimization uh, optimum. So, meaning that uh, because we're doing this brute force thing, the initial pose actually can always be quite off. This can be very far away, like 10 meters or more, uh, to, to the actual transformation um, that in the end fits this problem. And because of that, uh, you can very easily also reinitialize the whole localization algorithm if, for example, um, you have some case where the localization uh, maybe failed or you, the system was um, degraded and you need to basically restart everything. So it doesn't matter if you're drifting off basically because the first time that actually you have the transformations here back again because you're testing over such a lot, large space you can immediately then find the best position again. And other algorithms uh, actually uh, have an issue with that because they will get stuck in some local optimum and they will never be able to recover basically. But with doing this in the brute force way, this actually, so to say, comes for free a bit. Now, after map matching, the next step is to do the actual state estimation. So we will now take what we have from the results that we have from local association and so we know which actual raw measurements correspond to uh, each other and here we then also now know uh, what uh, landmarks that we have seen um, belong to what landmark in the map and for the state estimation there are several approaches available 
very popular for a few years was of course the uh, particle filter. Uh, other approaches are there as well as the EKF filter. We have basing techniques. Um, there are also nowadays deep learning techniques available, uh, but still very, very popular and the most advanced and giving the best performances are usually the graph-based approaches. Now the graph-based approaches um, in this domain stem mostly from, from the SLAM area, but they will or can also be utilized for doing pure localization as we can see. And I will show you how, how uh, this can be done. Now in, in general, the state estimation, you can formulate it like this. Uh, so you want to maximize the probability um, of the trajectory and the landmarks given, given the measurements. Uh, that we ha have and then you can uh, by doing um, by having the assumptions of uh, coercion noise for example and individual measurements you can transform this to actually a um, um, weighted least squares problem uh, which you can see here um, formulated and written down on the bottom of the page and when you're ha having this weighted least squares problem you can actually solve this with Gauss-Newton so there is one way of um, describing basically the structure of this Gauss-Newton problem and this is called factor graphs and specifically then in the end factor graph optimization. So in factor graphs you're trying to um, find the structure, you're modeling actually the structure of the optimization problem that you here have here at the top. And the two basic components for doing this are called the states and everything that here is denoted as a circle is a state and a state is something that you want to find like the vehicle pose or the position of a landmark and then you can have factors which loosely speaking so to say influence um, the, the result in the end of the states that you have. And a factor you can contains three basic things. Um, so the first thing would be the measurement itself, then the information matrix or respectively the covariance matrix of this measurement, and also very importantly the error function. And this error function actually then describes in a way uh, how the state will be changed or how it is affected according to the measurement and the current estimate of the state that you have. So in, in this example that you can see here, we have four vehicle poses and we have two landmarks. And you can see that from these four vehicle poses, two of them actually have GPS measurements. And these GPS measurements, you can include them if the vehicle that you're using has GPS if you're not having GPS, you can also exclude them. And the reason for why this is then still an, an optimization problem that is valid is that uh, you, for the landmarks that you have here, you are also um, adding the, po the, uh, informa the global information from the map that you uh, find, uh, were finding with the map matching. So you have this prior factor, so to say, or this unary factor that is also attached to the landmark here. And here you can see that, for example, the first landmark zero here was observed three times. And this is then highlighted with these uh, green landmark detection factors. And the second landmark in this case was only um, detected two times, basically from poses two and three. Uh, one important thing also um, that we will see later is to highlight here that all the poses in here are connected with an odometry measurement. And this is an assumption um, that makes it a bit easier in the end to um, incorporate um, all uh, measurements in a sliding window fashion. But we will see this in a minute. So the nice thing about um, modeling this factor graph is that there is a direct correlation 
to the Gauss Newton update that you're, that you're doing in the optimization step. And I will today not go into all the details of the Gauss Newton uh, optimization because that can be the topic of a, a full le lecture at least. Um, but the important thing to remember for now is that uh, the, the system matrix H, which uh, how is it mo uh, often called, um, the structure of that ma matrix directly reflects um, the factor graph here on the left side. So you know that uh, when you're looking at the matrix on the right side, whenever you have seen a landmark measurement, a landmark measurement, um, a landmark from a specific pose, this landmark measurement uh, then will be uh, very clearly assigned here to the specific rows and columns of the respective pose and landmark here. Now, um, when we now take a look at what we talk about uh, when we are having the sliding window in mind. We will see later that uh, having the structure from the Gauss-Newton update here will help us to continuously add and remove things in a very easy fashion to this whole matrix. So there is no need to always regenerate this, but because we are having a sliding window over time, meaning that we add new information and remove old information uh, we and we know since we know the structure we can very easily adjust the information in the matrix so in our example here the sliding factor graph that we are talking about um, has um, four poses and we we have here illustrated three different timestamps and the assumption here is that the time between consecutive poses is actually constant. And this drastically helps actually the implementation in the end. Because of this assumption, it's very easy to, to adjust a few things in the graph. So there, whenever you have a new measurement, it's very easy uh, to find the cor correct position in the matrix and, your, and uh, also the whole data structure that you have. Uh, the way I, how I am denoting the poses in the slide is that always on the right side you will find the most recent pose. Now, let's look at a toy example here from MATLAB basically, where you can see the sliding window approach in action. Now you can see here that this vehicle trajectory um, goes to the right side of the screen. And you can see also that we have um, several uh, landmarks in the map here. And you can see that we will detect some of the map uh, landmarks over time, and then we will add this to the graph. And then at the specific point in time, when we have reached the maximum length of the graph, we will also start removing basically stuff from the back of the graph. So the implication of that is um, that the vehicle trajectory really only depends on the measurements within this very specific sliding window. Um, we will later also talk a bit about how we can actually um, include, so to say, um, measurements that are not inside the sliding window anymore. Um, but since there are also downsides to that, consider please for now that really we are only basing uh, and using the information here within the graph, meaning that there is no marginalization going on. So for these sliding window factor graphs, um, they have a huge advantage over other techniques. First of all, when you're having this sliding window factor graph, you can see that from timestamp 4 to timestamp 5 here, we actually removed an association to a map landmark here. So re if you remember these um, yellow uh, unary factors um, added to the landmarks are the map associations. And if we ever find out that this association was wrong, we can very simply just remove the information here. And if we remove it here in the factor graph, that would then also, as I said, um, mean that we remove the information from the Gauss-Newton matrix that we were seeing earlier. So this is an, a very easy thing to do. If you now compare this, for example, to Kalman filters or um, particle filters, then this is not easy. 
because this they, they always uh, only basically uh, compute um, the um, most recent vehicle position and not the whole trajectory. But for the sliding window graphs, since we are always computing the whole trajectory and uh, meaning uh, that we incorporate all the information in there to minimize basically in the end the linearization errors, here we are very flexible in changing the structure of our problem. And then there is another very important thing in, pr in practice. If, you, if you're having a system mm, set up in the vehicle, uh, this probably means you have multiple computers that are connected over to each other. Um, so you might have, for example, some network delay. It might also be that you have some techniques, for example, as uh, when you have radar techniques, you sometimes need to aggregate uh, the sensor measurements over time a bit in order to derive actually and apply the landmark uh, detector um, on the data. So it might be that all the, the measurements that you have are somewhat delayed. But with this kind of approach, since this is so flexible, you can very easily just add this to the graph as soon as it arrived in the system. There is no need to kind of um, propagate back in time and then reapply the stuff as you would need to do with other techniques. But here you will just simply add that to the most recent graph uh, and then your information will be considered uh, in the final estimate of the pulse. Then the third thing is that you can also, because this is so flexible, then you, you can delay if, uh, certain decisions. If what you have found in map matching, if you're not sure that this is actually correct, you can also uh, wait until you um, are certain and then only include this very map matching step. So if you here take a look, then we have added another association uh, to the map at a different uh, landmark. So you can be very careful on, and conservative about um, adding information to the graph. Now to loosen this up a bit, let's take actually a look what this uh, looks in real life. So in this video, you will now see an actual, actually real world data um, of the very first scene that we saw in the beginning. We are standing here at the junction and then we will take a left turn here again. And um, you can see that there are tons of actually landmark measurements as we have also seen in, in the videos before. But now here you can see that actually the trajectory of the vehicle and you can see from where and from what pose we actually were able to uh, perceive, perceive specific um, landmark detections and in orange then here you now have the corners of the building. In green you have the um, landmark detections from the buildings and the facade whereas in grey for example you have all the pole measurements here. And for the poles and um, also for the corners here, whenever this is green, basically, that means that uh, we have uh, matched this to the map as well. What, what you are not seeing here is basically the false positive detections. So uh, you, the thing here is that because they're not showing up here, you can see that we were uh, able to remove them basically uh, from our systems. So we are only using the information that uh, was actually matched to the map here in this example. And then and as we continue driving here, uh, you can see that the trajectory here of the vehicle actually um, has the sliding window. So depending on the speed, and since we are using a fixed number of vehicle poses here, you can see that, that the length of the sliding window uh, changes over time. And as you restart, uh, continue driving here, you can still see this very same effect. And you were also able to see that we were removing stuff at the back of the graph. Now, I'd like to show you a bit um, what this technique actually can achieve in the real world, because this is always important for comparing this to other approaches and other techniques available. And the data set I will be uh, using to demonstrate this today is um, from Hamburg. And in this 
data set, there are many different um, varieties of scenarios. So uh, for example, we, there are some day drives, there are some night drives, there are parts where we have construction works going on, um, there are building canyons and also bridges uh, available. And this is very typically, this was not specifically chosen to, to, to demonstrate, and this is just driving around in the city, so to say. And for the approach that I was showing, um, you can see here that we can, on average, achieve a Euclidean um, error of around 10 to 11 centimeters, um, which really outperforms, of course, the low-cost GNS, uh, which uh, was what we expected, of course. And you can also see that we are outperforming, for example, an RTK re receiver here. And this really highlights here the, the issue that you have with only using GPS-based uh, localization systems in urban scenarios. And as I said uh, before and earlier, uh, having bridges and urban canyons is really a challenge in, in urban scenarios. It's completely uh, fine. Uh, to rely on them in, in scenarios where you have really open sky and you can guarantee um, that they always have good satellite reception. But as soon actually you're driving in tunnels and everything else, then this will get very difficult. However, the graph type of graph based approach that I was showing that is based on environment perception, where you're really having these landmarks, that there you can go one step further. And uh, I would also like to highlight that. Um, this is not an uh, not not a question of if you want to do uh, either one of these techniques, you can just combine them with the graph-based slide approach, uh, graph-based approach that I showed. You can still add just the RTK measurements to have the system more robust in general. And I think in practice this is a very good idea. Um, but really, this depends on the use case and the application that you have in mind. Now, when it comes to availability, this even gets more clear. Uh, and as you can see here, the landmark-based approach um, really outperforms the RTK and the low-cost GPS receiver here. Now, the, another interesting is also to compare this to other state estimation techniques. And uh, for this specific case, I have chosen to take a look at the particle filter here. So um, the results that you can see here really uh, mean that both approaches were running the exact same data. Really only the way of how you do the state estimation um, is different. And as you can see here, um, the graph-based approach um, always outperforms the particle filter one. Uh, and this is due to the way really how we can flexibly incorporate data. And also basically since we are um, having the sliding window graph over time and we are always optimizing over the, over the whole trajectory, meaning that we have uh, much fewer um, linearization errors actually over time. Now I, I would like to turn my attention a bit to another problem that I briefly mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. Now, uh, we were assuming so far that we, are have, well, that we have this general purpose map available. However, as I also said, these general purpose maps will get outdated over time. So in order to have a system that works reliably over a long period of time, you need some sort of process to make sure that the map will stay uh, updated. And uh, in this scenario, let me show you what, what you get as a result here if you just naively basically trying to compute the position of a landmark uh, with the sliding window that I showed before. You can see here that the, the vehicle basically is driving on the right side outside of the screen and you can see the various detections that we have for a landmark and then you can see um, that we also remove the detections from the grass uh, from the graph uh, over time. So the result then here is if you were paying attention here uh, you have, will have noticed that the position estimate is very very noisy so this, this raises the question, what uh, point in time do you actually use, for example, to, to 
store this data and send it um, or to update the map in the end, um, which is not, not very ideal with this sliding window graph approach where you are truncating basically in the back way, so meaning that you just throw away the existing measurements that you have and you're not reusing them in some way. So um, this, if we take a look at the factor graph itself here, you can see um, that actually these two different timestamps that you have here produce just different position estimates for the landmark, and this really is the problem. Ideally, you would want you would want this to be the very same numbers here. Uh, one common way of dealing with this sort of error is um, or problem is called marginalization. So in marginalization, um, you are kind of aggregating all the information that you are removing from the graph and you're adding them as a prior to all the other um, states that you have. So here on the left side, you can see the system matrix from Gauss-Newton before marginalization. And on top of that, you can see highlighted in uh, red everything that we need to remove from the graph. And when we do this marginalization, then in the next step, you can see that actually the state now is removed. And with marginalization here in this worst case scenario, you will see that all the, the elements or the entries of the matrix are basically now orange, meaning that you're that you do not have a sparse matrix anymore. So this is very dense now, and because this is very dense, optimization, for example, gets uh, slower, uh, and you're in introducing also linearization errors basically to the system now over time. And one approach and one, one thing that I also worked on in the past is um, to do sparse uh, things, and I will show this to you in a minute, how we can alleviate this problem. A bit. Now, in this toy example, again, as we have seen before, the um, graph where we just remove data from the you know, here you can actually see how this looks now in this worst case example. So all these orange boxes, or all the orange entries in the system matrix now um, are implicit constraints, basically, between the states that we have. So in this worst case, everything is fully connected now at the back of the graph. So, um, st although you're re retaining this information, this kind of then propagates over time and you will never get rid of this anymore when you have this marginalization. Now, the approach, as I said, is to, to, to improve this problem is to sparsify actually this um, uh, dense marginalization error. And I was working in the past on one, one method of doing this. And I will show you a bit about uh, how this, this works now. So the general idea is um, to take this dense marginalization and approximate it with the kolbert leibert divergence and um, then try to compute the target distribution here, uh, on, which is highlighted in green, that only has these individual priors for um, each landmark, landmark state. And um, there is actually a nice, nice way of how you can do this. Um, you can uh, really compensate a bit the linearization errors here, uh, although you're still using the global um, linearization estimates that you had from, from before. Uh, but let me not dive into the details. That's, if you're interested, you can read about that. But let me show you a bit of the, the results here, actually. So what we are seeing now here are where these green sparse priors that are that is now attached really to the landmark here. So this retains the information um, without having basically these um, fully connected constraints to other landmarks as well. But uh, this is only for this individual landmark. And as you were able to see, the position estimate here is now much more uh, stable over time. Now, if we look at the evaluation basically of this approach, um, um, what I did here is to introduce just artificial noise basically to the um, map that we had. And then when we are running the, uh, this algorithm that I just showed, you can then basically really improve 
um, this and refine the map over time. But also, as I said, um, I think it's not a good idea here to directly apply this in the vehicle, but actually I think this should then, then be sent out to a backend, um, be compared to um, the solutions that um, other vehicles um, were generating and then based on that um, update the map in general. So you have only very little information that returns burring to the backend, for example, because these landmark positions, this is not raw data anymore, that's something that we have pre-computed, so to say, and it's very, very light and based in terms of uh, the amount of data, data that you need to transfer. So with that, actually, today's lecture comes to an end, I would, and I would like to briefly summarize about what we have talked. So first of all, we were today talking a bit about the different aspects um, of localization. We were taking a look at uh, landmarks versus features versus raw data for localization. We also discussed a bit the impact of having GPS based um, localization in urban environments uh, in comparison to uh, environment based perception techniques. We compared a bit uh, the different types of maps uh, that we can use for localization and then uh, we were going through one approach of doing actually localization in urban environments in, in practice. And I hope this gives you an idea and a bit of the challenges that you need to respect when you are working on localization for autonomous driving. And there are of course a lot of points where you can actually do a few things differently, improve on what, what I have currently um, pre presented. But this can, uh, can of course be seen as a bit of a baseline and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we in, in detail also talked about the challenges of doing data association in the localization framework with graphs. And we explicitly also talked a bit about having the third party maps available um, that you can, for example, only generate really by having the aerial image, which is really an, adv adv an advantage to the industry. And then we talked about how the graph based sliding window approach uh, worked. We were highlighting the advantages and dis disadvantages of really having the sliding window. And uh, in the end, then we very briefly talked about. Uh, computing um, landmark refinements within the sliding window graphs that then could be used for uh, updating the map basically in, in the end. And with that I would like to thank you very much and uh, I wish uh, you learned a lot today and please feel free to leave any questions in the comments. Uh, I will be very happy to answer them. Have a very good day.